Hi, my name is Joshua Bliss. Uh, my major is nursing, and I chose SFA because their nursing school is really amazing, so I decided to finish up my degree here. I chose nursing as my major because I want to make a difference in everyone's lives, and with nursing I can do that uh, one person at a time every single day, if not more. I want to be able to step out into the world and go into a profession that I really truly care about. What I like about Nacogdoches is the ability of it to be such a small town, but also to have a great impact on everything that goes on around it. And of course, the beauty of Nacogdoches is amazing. The trees, the greenery, the arboretum, all of it is just comes together to create such a fantastic place. I would recommend SFA to my friends because the community of the entire school comes together to really seem like you're part of one big giant family. Everyone's so friendly and generous and so happy that you're here that makes it amazing. As always, Axum Jacks. All right, welcome back. Welcome to the healthcare panel. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our moderator, but before I do that, I want to say we're going to take a shorter break after this segment where we got to, time got to compress with the governor, but I didn't want to stand up and tell the governor he was talking too long. So, uh, so we're just going to make do, so we'll have the Attorney General speak uh, after this panel, but we're going to take a shorter break. Uh, but this is a very important panel, I deal with an issue, I see several physicians in, in the room and, and hospital administrators and others. Uh, this is something we all have in common. Everybody needs good quality health care. And this panel, I think, is well equipped to address those issues. And I'm very pleased and honored that we have Dr. Nancy Dickey leading the charge, leading the discussion today. Now, Dr. Dickey is a proud graduate of Stephen F. Austin State University uh, and holds the distinction of being the first female ever to be elected as the president of the American Medical Association, quite an accomplishment. She now serves at Texas A&M at the Health Science Center as Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs and has been in that capacity uh, since 2002, is that correct? Or am I reading this wrong? Okay, all right. All right, so, uh, so but, but she's uh, in that role, so, uh, she's been serving there and she does a lot of things. And what I appreciate is she's as the Executive Director of the A&M Rural and Community Health Institute, uh, she focuses on issues that are important to us. Rural Texas is particularly challenged right now when it comes to health care. I know we're going to talk about some mental health issues and other things that, that we've worked on this past session, uh, but in rural health, rural health, rural areas, uh, we're in East Texas, the most underserved, unrep underrepresented um, part of the state. We also happen to pair that with the worst health calamities that exist in the state. Uh, so higher need, lower population of providers, and it's also getting increasingly expensive with a population that may not have the levels of affluence to actually provide that or have that service. So this is a challenge we need to work on. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And with that, I will yield the microphone to our moderator, Dr. Nancy Dickey. Yeah. I'm married to a big guy, but I, you know, I always have to pull that microphone back down to, uh, to my level someplace. So. Uh, thank you. We're, we're looking forward to uh, hearing our, our panelists who are going to shed some light on the, uh, the uh, issues as well as the uh, potential solutions. But uh, before I give them a minute to introduce themselves, uh, let me uh, put some numbers behind what Representative Clardy uh, just said. Uh, as of eight months ago, Texas ranks as the 11th worst state for health care, uh, according to a survey looking at access to care, cost of care, and outcomes of care. Another survey ranked Texas 34th, um, uh, but as they put that survey together, they said uh, Texas was 50th in terms of the policy issues impacting health. Um, and uh, we, uh, we talked a little bit about rural health care because those issues are, are particularly important. Uh, Three million Texans are considered uh, rural. Uh, that's about 20% of the population. Uh, over uh, 170 of our 254 counties are rural. And then uh, uh, Representative Clardy uh, spoke about the uh, uh, problem of providers. Texas uh, has had a physician shortage 
ever since I started talking about this uh, issue, feels like we should be making some progress in that we uh, uh, continue to increase the size of our medical schools and the number of the medical schools, but our population is growing uh, as well. Uh, so we have a physician shortage as measured number of physicians per 100,000 people, particular shortages in some specialties. For example, the number of counties in Texas that do not have a psychiatrist would be equivalent to saying there were no psychiatrists in the state of Kansas. The number of counties that don't have an OB-GYN would be equivalent to saying there were no OB-GYNs in the entire state of Nebraska. Those are some impressive numbers. Um, and uh, while we certainly do have psychiatry and OB-GYN, oftentimes it's a long way away from parts of our population. So physician shortages, access to care issues, and continued problems with a large part of our population who are uninsured. And so even if there is a provider or a facility, uh, they may not have a ticket uh, to access the care that they need. Some of the small issues we're going to ask our panel uh, to address. Uh, we have a, a distinguished panel of, of representatives. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, and uh, they can tell us which parts of their, uh, their vita they want to uh, emphasize. Uh, and then uh, we'll go back around and ask each of them to make a brief opening statement. I have some questions here, but I know all of you have questions as well. So as uh, they're introducing themselves and making an opening statement, there are people in the, uh, audi uh, in, uh, out there in the theater. So if you'll raise your hand, if you have a question, they'll give you a piece of paper. Uh, or you can write down your question, and we'll try to uh, salt those questions in uh, throughout the hour that we have in front of us. Uh, and hopefully uh, gain some tremendous insights. So with that, Representative Schofield, would you like to start? Well, thank you. I, I think what she meant to say is we have a distinguished panel and me. <laughs> uh, I'm looking down here, I see the chairman of public health, the chairman of human services, and a physician who's the chairman of appropriations who has to pay for it all. Uh, it reminds me of when I was in high school, I was playing first base, and I went, no, oh, I thought the pitcher was a little too rushed, so I went over to the mound to calm him down. And he looked at me and said, what are you doing here? The only thing you know about pitching is you can't hit it. <laughs> and compared to them, I, that's kind of how I feel. Although I, I will say I was originally, my first foray into uh, the legislative arena was when I got hired by Governor Perry in 2003 to work on a tort reform bill, which I saw as a bill about lawsuits, and he saw as a bill to try to keep doctors from being shoved out of the state. Uh, and it did come back around. I had a, before one of their legislative sessions, I had a kidney stone. And while I was waiting for the results to come back, my urologist came up to me and said, I heard that you work for the governor. I moved here from Minnesota because of your tort reform. So we'd, we'd come around full circle. So I at least have that much that I can uh, say over these other guys. Mike, thank you. Can y'all hear me? Are the mics on? Mic's on. The green light's on, but uh, this works well too. Thank so my name's Ford Price, and I am uh, privileged to represent five counties up in the uh, center part of the Texas Panhandle. And so that's uh, about 540 miles uh, from here. And it's interesting um, when, when we talk about healthcare in Texas, one of the challenges, and Dr. Dickey sort of referenced it, is we talk about uh, the diversity across state and geographical diversity, demographic diversity, and, and those types of things. Um, and in many cases in healthcare and the debates that we have um, in committees and on the House floor, uh, in, many, in many terms, don't always uh, revolve around partisanship or Republican versus Democrat. It's often rural versus urban or, or some of the issues that uh, when, when you try to make policies uh, to affect everybody, how it's really going to impact something that works really well up in my neck of the woods may not work in uh, Dr. Zerwas's uh, territory or, or district and, and vice versa. So um, I'm privileged to chair public health. Um, last interim, I chaired the Select Committee on Mental Health, which uh, was a, um, a great experience, not only uh, to, to learn about some of the uh, opportunities and, and uh, some of the gaps that we have in our healthcare delivery system regarding behavioral health in Texas, but I had, uh, you know, a lot of help and support from not only the members um, at this uh, table, but uh, across the entire state, and it was refreshing because it was one of those things. It didn't matter if you're a r rural um, representative or, or a house member or an urban one um, like Mike or, or Dr. Zerwas, um, but it, it didn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat or uh, you represent a socioeconomically advantaged or disadvantaged area. Everybody saw the need to actually come together and do some really good things, and Dr. Zerwas, you all found the money to fund it, which was 
uh, critical to successfully uh, getting out of this session with some, some real progress. And in this interim, I'm also working as chair of the uh, Select Committee on Opioids and Substance Abuse. So um, a lot of issues and challenges in that area too. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel and thank you for including me. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm learning something already. Uh, I didn't know that Nebraska didn't have OB-GYNs and Kansas didn't have psychiatrists. <laughs> But I guess equivalent to, sir, equivalent <laughs> to. <laughs> uh, Richard Raymond, uh, state representative from Laredo. I actually grew up in Benavides in Duval County, in the next county, uh, in a town of 1,900 people. Uh, so I, you know, small town uh, roots, my first six years in the House. This is my 24th year in the House, but my first six years, <clears throat> I represented 25 little towns, and I love rural Texas. I consider Nacogdoches to be bigger than rural Texas. This is a big town uh, where I come from. Uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that I chair the Human Services Committee, and you know the main thing is we have oversight of the Health and Human Services Commission, uh, deal with the um, uh, Department of Family Protective Services, which is a CPS system, foster care system. Um, we used to have an agency called DAS, Department of Aging uh, Disability Services. It's now part of, uh, formerly part of HHSC, and that's long, dealing with long-term care, nursing homes, assisted living, and so forth. Uh, we have, a, you know, uh, a lot of challenges in the state of Texas. We're a state that is growing and is probably never going to stop growing. Um, we're hovering around 28 million people, and that's a lot of people. A lot of people want to come here, and a lot of people are being born here. Healthcare uh, and the healthcare issues that uh, we deal with, it, it, it's, you know, everybody has to deal with, everybody. From the time you're born, until the time you, you go meet your, your maker. And our challenge in Austin, as uh, Chairman Zerwa said a little while ago, when he was asked uh, uh, for us to come up with solutions, uh, well, we have solutions that's paying for them that, that is a challenge. And it is a challenge. Uh, I, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed uh, chairing this committee and working with my colleagues up here. I spent a lot of time on the Appropriations Committee before I became chairman of this committee. Uh, and the Healthcare issues affect every single part of the state, from the smallest town to the biggest city. Uh, I hope that we, what I want to take away more than anything from this gathering, as I always do in town hall type settings, is, is to, to hear what you're thinking and, and for you to ask us questions, specific questions, and to give us ideas. Uh, I've always been one of those people that I, I don't think I have all the answers. Uh, I just like people to be in the room that do have answers and that can help us. We represent you, we work with you. Uh, I'm very happy and thankful that Representative Clardy and Senator Nichols put this together. I, I wasn't able to make it the last time. I'm very glad to be here this time. Uh, I, I admire the effort and everybody who's participating. And so I look forward to us to have a discussion here and, and now I'll turn it over to the second most powerful guy in the <laughs> House of Representatives who wants to be the most powerful guy in the House of Representatives, <laughs> Dr. John Zerwas. <laughs> uh, I, I too want to extend my thanks to uh, Representative Clardy and Senator Nichols for uh, their hard work on this and to the Chamber of Commerce of Nacogdoches. I know they put in an incredible amount of time and effort to pull these things off and uh, this, is, this is just a great uh, forum that they've created. I attended the one two years ago and I think probably the size has doubled since that time and I think it's a reflection of the fact that they're touching on highly relevant issues. Uh, Nacogdoches is a great town to come to. Uh, I invested heavily in Nacogdoches as I sent two of my children here to go to college. And uh, I told the president I feel like I should have a building named after me as much as I <laughs> spent time here and stuff. But uh, wonderful city and uh, is doing great things. Not to mention, as the governor noted, you know, this is, uh, this is really the birth of Texas. Uh, and uh, it's just a great town to be part of. Uh, I have spent my life in health care. I'm, I'm a physician and anesthesiologist. and. Uh, uh, Dr. Dickey, thank you for, for moderating this panel. Uh, I'll just say as a side note, Dr. Dickey is truly one of those great trailblazers, a mentor of mine. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Betty Stevenson, who was also a mentor to both of us, uh, an anesthesiologist, uh, has done great things, uh, you know, certainly for the practice of medicine and has been just an incredible role model uh, for uh, women physicians, uh, you know, in particular, but to all of us, I would say she's been a great role model in terms of the things that can be accomplished. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dickey, for your leadership. 
Uh, I had the, uh, the unusual opportunity about 12 years ago now, as I've now served 12 years in the House, uh, to step into a side of health care that I will tell you I had absolutely no intention or ambition to even do. Uh, but it came my way, uh, and I was convinced that this was something I should do, that I should leave, you know, a primary role that I had as a chief medical officer at a major health care system in Houston and, and still a practicing anesthesiologist to, to step into this public policy side of, of uh, you know, of service, frankly. And, uh, you know, what came along with that was uh, under Speaker Craddock and subsequently under Speaker Strauss, I had the opportunity to serve and particularly in the area of uh, financing of health care in terms of what the state of Texas is involved in. And uh, have since had the opportunity to chair appropriations. And, and what I have found, although we don't establish policy, uh, you know, what, what does happen when you serve on appropriation is you can either bring policy to life or you can absolutely strangle it and kill it um, by not providing any funding for it. And so. Uh, by virtue of serving on this committee, you really have the opportunity, one, to learn about everything that the state of Texas does, uh, but you do also have that opportunity to put your fingerprints on a variety of the uh, policy decisions that are being made. Uh, this team up here that I had the opportunity to sit with uh, have done great things uh, for the state of Texas in their own unique ways, and I consider it a, a privilege to get to be uh, with them up here today. But just to give you a kind of an overview of what the budget looks like, uh, what the role that health care plays, and how everything else is kind of, kind of sort of pins off of that. Uh, we had a $216 billion budget during the previous biennium. We came into this session and we were told, you have no more money. You have no more money. That's what the comptroller tells us in, es in essence when he delivers the biennial revenue estimate or the BRE as we like to call it. And we get that notice usually the day before we convene on our, our general session. We basically said, well, okay, we have no more money, but yet we have a million more people in the state of Texas, and we've had a modest amount of inflation. How do you make that work? Um, you know, 80 billion of that is healthcare related. Another 80 billion of that is related to education and both higher ed and the foundation education program. What it tells you is, is that we are now spending almost as much money on health care as we are spending in education. And I will tell you, I don't think that's what the priorities of the state of Texas should be. That may sound a little odd coming from somebody who spends his life in health care, and still that's how I actively make my living, is uh, going into the operating room and anesthetizing people uh, you know, several times a week, and, um, and um, it's, it's a great living. But, you know, the point is, is that I think when you look at it from the state's perspective, the things that we need to be looking at is exactly what the governor focused on. And that is, first and foremost, I think we need to be focusing on the next generation of Texans and the, and the workforce, their education, and the needs that we have going forward. That needs to be the thing that we look at. So the investment of the amount of money that we put there certainly is appropriate. Uh, but I think what we need to be very careful about is that we don't pull away from that investment. And that's where health care comes into play, because a big cash-hungry beast in health care is called the Medicaid program. And I don't say that in a derogatory way. I just say that it is an entitlement program that I absolutely believe the state of Texas should be involved in. Without it, there would be a, a catastrophe, not only financial, but certainly human catastrophe as a consequence of not being in it. And we know that because we looked at it strategically at one time. Uh, back in 2009. But it is a program because it's an entitlement and because today probably nearly, Dr. Dickie, 60% of the babies born in this state are born into the Medicaid system. That will give you a sense of what the level of poverty is that we have in the state of Texas. And Texas, I will assure you, is not as generous as some other states when it comes to its Medicaid program, such as it, as you see out in California. So we are running a pretty lean program out there, but yet it now is equivalent in terms of the amount of money that we spend in health care with what we spend in education. We have to be very, very, I think, astute about how we spend the health care money because we can't starve education. I think that's absolutely the first and 
four most important thing we do. We have to be sure we provide a safe and secure environment. And so our public servants in terms of say, uh, law, law enforcement must be well funded. And we need to continue to pre create a state that is very attractive to businesses to come so that we continue to thrive for decades to come. And that means an investment in infrastructure. And I think those are things that are incredibly important for us as a state to, to be aware of. But we have to be sure that as we look at our, our health care needs, and they are enormous, there is, nobody's going to doubt that. Uh, the things that uh, poor price is leading in terms of not only his work on behavioral health care, which was absolutely phenomenal. You know, despite having not enough money, we did find a way to pay for some of those very, very important behavioral health uh, uh, bills that he brought forward. And so my, my hat's off to him. My hat's off to him for addressing and stepping up what is the other thing that is consuming us as a nation. And to some, you know, certainly in the state of Texas, and that is the opioid crisis. And as a guy who, you know, administers, you know, high, high potent narcotics, fentanyl on a regular basis in terms of the operating room environment, uh, I can tell you for a fact, you know, those are drugs that are one, highly effective, and two, they are incredibly addictive if they fall into the hands of people that are susceptible to using them. Addictive from the point that you use them, just like cocaine. And so taking this on, I think, is one of those healthcare crises for that I want to compliment you for leading that. Uh, there is a way for us to remedy that, and I'm certain that we're going to find that way as we go down the road. Here. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, look forward, Dr. Dickey, you. to your, your, your questions and those of the audience. So let me remind you, if you have questions, if you'll raise your hand, they'll bring you a, uh, a slip of paper and, uh, and bring your they'll bring your question up to the front. I do want to uh, make apologies. We have a couple of uh, panelists, a couple of empty chairs up here. Uh, who uh, didn't uh, get out in front of the rainstorm and unfortunately could not get here from Austin. Uh, so the, these uh, four uh, spectacular folks are going to uh, uh, take up all the slack that happens to be there. Uh, so one of the questions I, I think uh, is how do we and, and what is the state doing right now to try to help attract professionals? If, if we had a... Um, oversupply of physicians, uh, it might be easier. The fact that we have an undersupply of physicians and nurses, pharmacists and dentists, okay, makes it tough because that means there are, there are jobs in urban areas and, and they don't have to look outside urban areas in order to be employed. But what is or what could the state be doing to try to attract professionals into the smaller marketplaces uh, so that uh, individuals wouldn't have to drive quite so far in order to access care? I'll, John? I'll just jump in and let, let my let my colleagues uh, follow on on that. We we have actually uh, provided some programs in terms of loan forgiveness in the past, as you may recall. We we have tried to extend that out to other uh, professionals that deal in certain things beyond just the physician, so that basically if they'll go and serve in underserved areas over a period of about four to five years, a percent of any loan that they have taken out to get through medical school and residency. Uh, will be forgiven. Uh, it's um, not, un not uncommon now for physicians uh, when they actually get out into the workforce to be carrying a $200,000 or more um, debt. Uh, interestingly, dentists is even higher. Uh, it's probably up in the $280,000 range. Mm -hmm. Nurses are carrying debt far, and we know just uh, you know, getting a bachelor's degree, people are carrying a twenty-five dollars to $30,000 debt sometimes. So, the kind of programs that are out there that can actually relieve that debt is a very powerful way to attract physicians, at least, into some of these uh, smaller underserved communities out there. And often, once they get established and they develop the, the friendships and relationships and, and the support of the community, they, they do end up staying there. Um, another, another way that I think that uh, we can tap into serving the, the uh, communities is through technology. I think that we have uh, not fully leveraged the use of telemedicine in a way that I think can dramatically improve or, uh, the uh, ability to deliver health care. It will expand the reach of, of the physicians and, and others out there in the community that I, I think uh, will solve a lot of the issues that, that we have out there. So let me jump in there uh, and turn perhaps to uh, Representative Price. Um, I understand that in, in your neck of the woods we don't have any problem with connectivity because uh, the uh, oil companies are, are told that they need to provide, or they need to have, I guess, in order to function, 
uh, connectivity. And so uh, apparently a lot of those uh, oil derricks uh, help make sure you're connected. But we have a lot of places, and East Texas, I think, is one of them, uh, where the connectivity is a little less reliable. So right. I think telemedicine is, in fact, a huge potential but I don't want to be the one waiting for my consultant on the other end and having one of those uh, iffy connectivities. What are we doing about connectivity and what should we be doing so that telemedicine's real? Uh, the, the reality is, um, well, first of all, let me back up because uh, Dr. Zerwas is, is correct. Uh, the chairman was talking about telemedicine in the bill we recently passed and you and I've had a conversation, I guess, about a week ago um, uh, on that topic. And, uh, SB 1107 was a bill that passed last session, which really did uh, help um, the, the you know telehealth um, you know market Removed in Texas. Removed a great many and, barriers to, to yeah, being able to do it, this. Yes. You know, the, one of the one of the things that we heard over and over again was that it wasn't technology that was a barrier; it was always a reimbursement or having insurance coverage for uh, services that would be provided over an online or a, a connection, an audio visual connection that that could be performed in an office setting. So uh, we broke that barrier down, and, and so SB 1107 now requires a health insurance company to uh, cover, if they cover a service in person, to cover that service if it's provided in the physician's independent medical judgment, uh, if it's appropriately delivered through um, these, these uh, audiovisual connections or, or store and forward technology, the kind of things that are defined in the bill. So that's a real good thing for providing better access. It doesn't necessarily help the physician shortage, but in areas you mentioned, you know, 185 of the 254 counties across Texas have no psychiatrist. Telepsychiatry is one area that that's going to make a big difference in, and it, it, it helps rural areas, uh, places where there uh, is connectivity, but, you know, they might not have a licensed professional. One of the ch uh, challenges, though, in many of the rural communities and less populated areas across Texas is broadband access. Um, it was interesting. When we, uh, last week, I was touring um, the Health Science Center at Texas A&M, and one of the uh, fourth-year students actually said, what are you all doing about broadband access? Um, and that was a pretty insightful question because uh, most people take for granted that the technology is available to everybody and it's out there. And the technology is, it's just access sometimes and having a reliable connection uh, is not everywhere. And so um, we are seeing efforts to, to increase and strengthen that and, and, and it's expensive and it takes some time and obviously Texas is so large, it's not everywhere. But we are uh, making strides in, in trying to do a better job of making that available in all communities so that uh, some of these barriers that have existed for a long time, not only technologically, but maybe just practically, um, are being broken down. And I really do believe that, um, you know, with respect to an aging population in Texas and a growing population in Texas, we will look back uh, maybe, you know, five, ten years from now and look at the way some, some services, some uh, health care services are delivered. Uh, and, and really, it'll be very commonly delivered through telemedicine, I, I believe. Um, and right now, it seems like sometimes you hear about it, you hear about consultations on the telephone, and some people consider that to be just telehealth or telemedicine, but I think we'll see it expand so much larger than that um, in the future, and we will, we will be very you know, glad that uh, I think Texas is doing some things uh, correctly uh, on that forefront, and it, it was uh, well overdue. Thank you. Representative Pena, uh, uh, Raymond, I'm sorry. Uh, Shelfield, either of you, uh, b before I jump in and step on somebody? Well, on that, on this issue, I, I, I totally agree with where we're going. I mean, think about, you know, I've had a couple of surgeries, like rotator cuff surgery, and uh, doctors today are using, their, when they operate on you, they're looking at a screen, they're looking at something on a computer, because it, it, it allows them, it affords them a better picture of what they're working on. So they're not even looking at you. They're working on you, but they're looking at this. That's, that's a good example of why I think you're right. Telemedicine is something that's going to help us tremendously because, you know, again, I grew up in a little town. We were lucky. We had a, a, a doctor there who was a World War II field surgeon, you know, and once he passed away, that was it. You know, we didn't have any doctors. You had to go 26 miles to go to a doctor. Uh, and the state of Texas is so big uh, that I think this, this modern technology that we have now uh, is going to make a, a world of difference. And I don't think people should be afraid of it. Uh, I think it, it, it's something that we can embrace and that will, that will help a lot. Thank you. So, uh, uh, um, 
question is, considering the lack of physicians accepting Medicaid in rural areas, and, and the statistics are that rural areas have a higher percentage of Medicare and Medicaid patients percentage-wise uh, than do urban areas, is there any consideration for increasing reimbursements for providers taking care of, willing to accept uh, Medicaid patients in physician shortage areas? Yes, the chairman of human services supports that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so here's one of the places we have a solution. How about the money, Dr. Zerwas? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think all of us would say, you know, it's just like any of the shortages. We were talking about it with regard to our teachers earlier. Uh, you know, the, the money plays a, a part in that for sure. Uh, when we start looking at raising uh, the... Um, fees, the fee schedules that we pay for uh, physicians, let's say, and, and in 2009, I think we did bump them up as a consequence of the ARA funds that came down from the, the federal government, uh, but that was only for a period of time, and so to even make a modest increase and make it only for, let's say, primary care physicians and include your OB-GYN in there because they're frequently the primary care physician for, for women, uh, that becomes a very big number very fast. And then if you start looking at extending that out to the dental profession and others, uh, you, get, you get into the billions of dollars pretty quickly once you start stacking that up. And so it is, uh, it's difficult, I will say, uh, in, in terms of you know, coming up with that in light of what are all the other needs that you have out there. And, and I'll go back to something I said in my opening comment. You know, remember, we need to educate. We need to keep people safe. We need to maintain an attractiveness for, for business out there. And so is that, is that more important than perhaps, you know, the investments on, on the side regarding education and so forth? Those are the decisions we have to make. I'm not making a judgment of that right now, but every two years, uh, we do have to come and, and we have to set what those priorities are out there. And again, when it comes to physician payment rates, um, that number gets big uh, really fast. Hey, let me, can I jump in on something? This is kind of a side note. I know this is not the education panel. But, you know, th there are some long-term uh, ideas that we need to try to implement. And, and so, for example, I've said for a while now that I, I believe looking to 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the line, uh, we need to do a better job when kids start school of, of educating them on two things. Uh, one is nutrition and two are drugs. We don't do that. And I understand there are only so many minutes in the day for kids to go to school and there's so many things we want them to learn and I've had these debates with you know other colleagues of mine who, who focus on education and they push back on me but, I, but I'm telling you I think as a society if it isn't clear by now that we need to do more on nutrition so that we don't have rising incidences, incidences of diabetes type 2 diabetes and heart disease etc you got to start from the very beginning I'll give you a simple example and when I was a kid, I'm 57 years old, when I was a kid, you'd be driving down the road or you'd be sitting in the back seat, you'd throw paper, you'd throw trash out the window, you wouldn't think, you'd give it a second thought, you would just do it. People did it. And then, some years ago, the state of Texas started a very simple campaign called Don't Mess With Texas. My kids, then later on, here I get married, I got kids, my kids would never even think of littering, right? Because we taught them from the very beginning this is something you're not going to do. And so I can remember how different highways looked back then compared to now. That's a simple example of where we all know education works. I think we have to start from, from the very beginning and figure out this has got to be part of the curriculum. Drugs will mess you up and mess up your life. And if you don't do something about trying to eat right and understand what's bad for your body, then you're not going to have as good a quality of life. And by the way, it ends up costing government, taxpayers, it costs us a lot in terms of, of, of health care because so many of the illnesses that are out there are related to bad nutrition, right, or drug abuse, et cetera. So that's, that's, that's not necessarily this panel. I know it's more the education, but I feel very strongly we have to decide as a society that we're going to start doing that from the time a kid goes to school. You know, and, and Dr. Dickey, one of the things uh, I think that we – really hate to deal with um, every session in the legislature sometimes are scope of practice battles and you know just the the uh, nastiness that goes along sometimes with that and, and and so what I mean by that 
um, is every session uh, it seems like there are efforts to to um, you know maybe change uh, some of the uh, um, allowable services that might be provided by different practitioners up and down the healthcare spectrum. And so um, as chairman of public health, um, we deal with a lot of those bills and see them. And they're difficult. No one likes to talk about them and they're one of the least favored types of bills I think that, that, that are um, filed. I mean, Chairman Raymond, you filed one last <laughs> session and maybe a couple of sessions ago too with regard to um, the ability of physical therapists to to practice without a referral well, that was a good bill. from a physician. No, no. And I mean, that one should and, have passed. And, and very, uh, it got a lot of attention, <laughs> didn't it? I know that you had a lot of folks contacting uh, your office as they were mine, and that's just one example. But something I think we will continue to do is look at as the population, as the stress on the uh, healthcare providers across Texas increases because of our growing population. Uh, we will. We will continue to look at those bills. They will continue to be filed, and, and you know, we will look at the, the different uh, practice levels up and down to make sure that everybody is practicing to the scope of their training and to their licenses. And, you know, last session there was a bill for nurse practitioners to practice, um, you know, at least, and, and a lot of this, I think, was driven by not only their profession, but actually I have a county in, in the district that I represent where there is one health care provider. That's it. It's a nurse practitioner. And she um, lost her, her supervising physician. And uh, you had to be in the same Medicaid network. Um, you, so you didn't just have to have a physician monitoring and, and supervising your patients and your files, but you had to have one that was willing to be a Medicaid provider in the same provider network. And so uh, it took her years to find another one. And meanwhile, uh, she is it for an entire county and, and surrounding communities. So we did change that um, to allow uh, the supervising attorney, um, excuse me, uh, physician to um, be outside the, the network, which I think Restrictions like that, regulations that have been longstanding, uh, des deserve uh, continuous review because those are some of the things that at least it may not go as far as the NERC pr practitioners wanted us to go in the legislature in terms of removing a requirement for a, a supervising physician, but it did uh, release some of the restrictions there that made it easier for her to at least, and, and those like her, to provide services um, under a little bit better regulatory framework and, and continue to provide uh, care to the those that are covered by Medicaid. I think uh, something that, that something that Chairman Price just said reminded me of, of the biggest challenge we face in any arena, and that's that this is an incredibly diverse state. We have counties like the one I live in with 4.5 million people, and we have Loving County with 80 people, and we try to impose the same standard on all of them. You know, Ford was saying he's got a, a county with one health care practitioner. I have a five-mile stretch of I-10 in my county with three gigantic hospitals in it. You know, when, when you come to our people and say, you know, we want to be able to have nurse practitioners practice without a physician, we're like, we can't swing a dead cat without hitting a doctor. You know, why do we want somebody with less qualification doing it? And we all come together and try to find one, one size that fits all. Uh, and I was thinking about that when we were talking, when they were answering the first question. And, and there's sort of, to me, a merger between the telemedicine, which is the wave of the future for certain things, and what I think will always be true, which is as a patient, you want to have a physician who knows you, who has seen you repeatedly, and who, at, who when they see you has an idea when something's off or has dealt with you enough that they understand what's going on. And I think there's an opportunity to merge those two. That my hometown school, the University of Houston, like many places, wants a new medical school. That's what they want is a medical school. And I said to them, what good will that do if your students end up going to St. Louis to do their residency? Because anybody here who's in the healthcare professions will tell you the number one indicator of where you're going to practice is where you do your residency. And I think if we can find a way to take these two issues, and maybe you have the University of Houston Medical School, but maybe you work some residency slots into places like here, or other places around that are close enough that you can go in and do the things you need to do there, but be working out here. If you have a resident come out here to Nacogdoches, I'd say I've just been here two days, and I'm thinking I may not want to go home. 
uh, you know, that's, that is how you're going to get to keep and retain quality healthcare professionals. And I think if, you know, to the extent that we can incorporate telemedicine into that where they're getting instruction from back, back at the ranch as to how to do what they're doing here, you can both have telemedicine for when you need it and real live physicians in your community, which you're always going to need. You've actually uh, opened a, a topic uh, that, that is extraordinarily important. We've uh, uh, recognized the physician shortage. We've opened three new medical schools in the last uh, five or six years. Uh, have we kept up with the residency slots, what we call graduate medical education, GME slots? Uh, because when I graduated from medical school, John, when you graduated from medical school, uh, you might not have matched with your number one choice of program, but I don't remember people not matching. Uh, we now have very good medical schools that have three, four, five percent of their class that don't match with, that is, they are not selected to go on in their training. You as taxpayers have paid a quarter of a million dollars per graduate over the course of their time, uh, and, and if they don't get a residency training, they really can't use their profession. So have, have we kept up, have we established policy that says if we're going to open a medical school, there better be a plan to uh, open graduate medical education? Yeah. We, we haven't established the policy. We've established the goal to have 1.1 GME slots okay. per uh, medical school slot. And for exactly the reason you say, and what Representative Schofield said, you know, that, that is the, the, probably the most likely place where a physician ends up is where they do their, right. their GME. Uh, Texas is a little bit better on that compared to others, and part of that is uh, we have a, an incredibly attractive environment to practice medicine. Tort reform uh, changed the environment to practice medicine enormously from a medical legal point of view. Uh, we have an abundance of, of really high quality academic uh, medical schools and, and resources in the state of Texas. Uh, we're, we're, we're a state that has, despite some of the things uh, Dr. Dickey said, which is a real lack of care available in certain places, we have enormous amounts of care available in places like Houston, Texas, where I'm from, and, and uh, there's, there's just not, you, there's, a, there's somebody there for every disease that you can imagine <laughs> out there uh, to treat you in Houston, Texas, but yet we have these other things. That's why I always go back to the connectivity with telemedicine. Um, you know, to take an example of that, uh, if, you, if, if you get a facility that is stroke credential, let's call it that, um, you know, that shows up you know, 50 miles away, 100 miles away, and get them to that location and connect them with, let's say, one of the stroke doctors at Memorial Hermann Hospital, which is world-renowned for treatment of stroke, uh, you will see that person recover their arm and their leg right there in front of you. It's one of the most magical things you'll ever see. If they have a stroke that is related to a clot, and they bust that clot with the clot-busting drug, and they can't move their right arm or their right leg, uh, or both, you know, you will actually see that recovery within within minutes uh, when that treatment. That's a that's that's a something that has happened in as a consequence of telemedicine. We have saved people from a, a horrible life of disability as a consequence of telemedicine right. being used uh, in that fashion and stuff. So, so you know, we we need to look at really, I think, first and foremost, uh, our GME slots mm -hmm. before we go about opening other medical schools. Uh, when the University of Houston came to me and said, John, we'd really like for you to advocate for this. And I said, well, I'm happy to advocate for my alma mater to have a medical school, but I don't want to advocate for the state to spend money and then send them to Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arkansas, and other neighboring states. I said, we don't need to be doing that. And what they have done, to their credit, is they have gone out there and partnered with uh, HCA, big, big hospital, a company out there and uh, have identified those those GME slots. What I'll also point out is that even even in a, a budget uh, session that we had this last time, we found money in order to continue to expand GME slots for exactly the reasons that have been identified. We're going to just continue to lose money to some you know for some of these investments that we've made for graduates. So we give them a hard time about policy, but the reality is there are a lot of things that are are done that it takes a long time for those of us who are not sitting in the house to feel the impact of, but they're there, from loan repayment to uh, GME planning and, and uh, so forth. I have a whole bunch of questions here, and I, and I can't possibly get to all of them, but um, uh, there was a, a question about what the intent was 
and then I want to get, for the last two minutes, I want to get back to the opioid crisis. So a couple of minutes. Uh, what was the intent on the uh, Senate bill, uh, DNR bill, and uh, uh, have you had feedback in terms of the impact of that? Well, we don't have any senators here, so you're safe, yeah. right? Well, well, the, the DNR <laughs> bill is, uh, is, uh, is, he is the have a mic uh, right do not now. resuscitate bill. Very common <clears> that uh, <throat> we would have uh, patients come into a hospital setting that uh, were basically at, at, at an end-of-life situation or, or a very futile situation, and, and they would be designated as uh, DNR, do not resuscitate. Sometimes that decision was made uh, you know, by the physician without consulting with uh, the family. Usually the patient was in a situation that they couldn't you know, reasonably give consent for that, and so you'd turn to other family members. And there was a sense that you know, this was something, that obviously the gravity of a decision like that, as much as you might trust your physician and so forth, uh, would need to be made in consultation with, with family. There is no doubt that that's, that's, that's a very, very reasonable thing to do. Um, there does create some issues sometimes, especially in an intensive care setting where a family is not immediately available and frankly, to some extent, uh, instituting resuscitative measures on certain patients is almost cruel and cruel punishment because of the things that we perhaps would try to do in order to salvage somebody's uh, life. Uh, and so, so there, there, there's some hiccups associated with it that I don't think we fully have ironed out, especially in the intensive care setting. But the idea that, that you know, family members or others, uh, you know, should have the opportunity to say, you know, you know, do or do not resuscitate this person that's in this circumstance. And certainly to honor, if somebody has said and, and, and you know, has full capability and says, I don't want to be resuscitated, then that should carry. And no family member should be able to overrule that. You know, I mean, m both my uh, parents and uh, my late wife died in my home under hospice care. Uh, there was a point clearly, I mean, in fact, to be in the hospice care, you are a do not resuscitate patient. I mean, that's, you, you are recognized <coughs> as being at the end of your life and it's just been about, you know, providing comfort care and, and relief from pain and suffering and, you know, pass in a very honorable and respectful way. But, but that, that's the kind of thing it, it, it has to, I think there are some hiccups in certain settings, Dr. Dickey. Um, but in general, I think the spirit of what was being proposed is, is right. And, and that is, is that, you know, as physicians, we shouldn't just consider that our sole purview to make that decision, that that decision should be made, at least in conversation with, with family members. So uh, um, I didn't save you quite two minutes, but uh, the, the question is, um, how is Texas going to uh, approach the op opioid crisis? Um, research has indicated, for example, that the profession of physical therapy and other uh, sorts of non-pharmaceutical therapy have been effective in addressing uh, the opioid crisis. Uh, so what are, what are we going to do in Texas? Well, the, the, the issue is a complicated one, so there's not one simple answer to that question. Uh, however, we started, uh, the, the speaker appointed a 13-member committee. We started having hearings last month, and we'll continue to do that from, from now through next fall and prepare recommendations uh, for the 86th legislative session. Um, but I think there's a, you know, some things that we have done already, which will, we'll, you know, will take some time, as you mentioned, from a policy standpoint to see if it's working, the enhancing of our prescription monitoring program uh, across <clears throat> Texas to, you know, stop not only bad practitioners from overprescribing um, opioids, but also to uh, eliminate the bad patients from going out and doctor shopping and getting multiple pr prescriptions from uh, multiple physicians. Now, you know, interestingly, at our last hearing, we heard there's four cities in Texas which are among the top 25 in the country um, uh, who are suffering the worst under statistically under um, the crisis, and that was Odessa, Amarillo, Longview, and Texarkana. Uh, so two of those are right here in East Texas, and interestingly, those are near uh, neighboring states, and so it might be easier maybe for, for some individuals to travel. Uh, and when states don't talk to one another or share that information, it makes it easier. So I think enhancing our PMP and making sure it's working properly is, is one of our charges. Um, we passed a bill to make uh, naloxone, I guess, more available over the counter with a standing order from, uh, from physicians to pharmacists and, 
And there's a huge uh, educational hurdle here, I think, properly disposing of medication and making sure we, uh, we have medication cleanouts and strategies in place that uh, we, we get folks, uh, you know, at least more aware and become more knowledgeable about the proper disposing or uh, disposal techniques of medication. That will be important. Um, there's a shared responsibility, no question, among manufacturers, uh, you know, dispensers, um, pharmacists, uh, practitioners, and patients. Um, I think that, that we are just on the very beginning of our committee's work, but in all of those areas, we're going to be able to, I think, enhance um, through some, some, some legislative efforts and maybe through some just general awareness and best practices what will happen. Not everything that's going to need to occur will be done through the legislature, but um, I think that we will see um, progress made in that area for sure. Texas, even though statistically we are not in as bad a shape on this crisis as maybe some other states have been, West Virginia, Ohio, um, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, some of these other states really have suffered. We are uh, in a position to, um, um, you know, get there if we're not careful. So we will continue to, uh, like I said, take some of these actions or follow up on what we have already started, but then also look for areas where we can improve some practices and, and uh, make a meaningful difference. Thank you. I, I see colleagues and hospital administrators, and I know we could have uh, continued to ask a wide range of questions uh, for a great deal longer than this, but unfortunately, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting the hook uh, so that uh, we uh, try to stay somewhat on time. Please help me thank these four great, great legislators. All right, four, now I'm going to put you on a quarter for them, panel. Yes, thank you. Good to meet Plenty of and we're going to turn it back to Representative Party, right? All right. Appreciate it. Good job, Jerry. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you. Thanks for joining. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dickey. Thank you again, panel, for being here. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Raymond may need some uh, medical attention himself. So uh, you, you got so two much. doctors. This is your chance, Richard. Uh, we're going to take. Let's take a very. If you need to take a break, please do it. But we're going to start back very quickly with this next session. Try to keep on the calendar. Uh, I know we have uh, General Paxton is, I know he's in the building, I don't know if he's in the room. Um, and so we're going to have a, a, a really a treat to have the Attorney General here speak with us.